The anime starts by showing us some demi-humans working for a cruel human who whips them to hurry up because to him they're just trash in this world. On the other hand, a young ugly man named Banaza is the opposite. He comes to thank the demi-humans for their work and gives them some money. But a group of humans starts looking at him badly. To prevent trouble, one of the demi-humans tells Banaza he can't accept it. But Banaza insists because he wants the good workers to have something to eat. When Quinn appears, he convinces the demi-humans to take a break and eat, making them very happy. This puts a couple of other humans against him. Anyway, the young man just wants everyone to get along in this world, but his assistant knows it's not easy to change everyone's opinion. While talking, the young man starts glowing for some reason, and by the time Quinn realizes it, the boy is gone. The main reason for this is that he was part of an occasion from another world where they were trying to find a perfect hero. This is when we meet Claro, the summoner from the Magical Kingdom, who quickly asks the boy to undergo some tests on his statistics. Banaza insists he's just a merchant and doesn't know why he was summoned. The summoner explains that according to their ancient traditions, they summon potential heroes from other worlds to help them fight the Dark King. When a maid comes with a magic sphere, she asks him to put his hand on it to see his best attributes. When the test ends, we see that all his attributes are too low. The assistant starts to worry because anyone in that world can get those statistics. Many in the headquarters start to panic because they wasted a spell on someone completely useless. This hurts the protector's heart a little, but someone with practically maximum statistics has appeared nearby, being the true legendary hero. And as soon as he saw our main character with his low stats, he wasted no time mocking him, quickly becoming the center of attention. Meanwhile, our poor protagonist was completely ignored because the king had now found a perfect candidate who would save them from doom. As the sun set in that magical kingdom, our protagonist was just coming to terms with being in a whole new world and all he wanted was to go back home. But the next day, the royal guards forced him onto a cart, which was not the most comfortable way to travel. This was all due to a conversation from the past where the king himself had informed him that they couldn't send him back to his world because the transportation gate had been completely closed. However, they hadn't left him without responsibility, and at least they had given him special permission to live peacefully outside the kingdom. At the beginning of the journey, our guy tried to get some information from the person driving the cart, but they had orders not to speak to him. Still, our protagonist tried to get as much information as possible, and in the end, the person driving confirmed that he wasn't a slave of the kingdom. If there really was a world where demi-humans were slaves of humans, it must be a horrible one, concluding the conversation with the young man, who simply gave up and began to remember what his old world was like, maybe life in this new one wouldn't be so bad after all. When they finally arrived at their destination, the half-human handed him some money in a bottomless bag since the kingdom was practically responsible for him. But before leaving, the half-human wanted to give him a piece of advice. If you don't want to die, leave this place, as the soldiers of the Dark King tend to lurk around the area. This advice might not be of much use to him now. Shortly after, he encountered a group of slimes that nearly defeated him, although he managed to overcome them, having to sacrifice his sword in the process because it was too weak. But at least we see that he reached level 2, where all his statistics were marked with a strange symbol. He also gained a second card where, with the new level, he acquired spells to use with a bunch of windows. In one of them, it showed that he had activated the tracking and location ability, making it very easy for monsters to track him. Considering that the sword they gave him broke after just three hits, the boy understood that they wanted to get rid of him quickly. So, he finished removing the curse from his bottomless bag, and consequently knew he had to find a safe place to protect himself. Even the system was warning him about this forest because nearby there were substances emitted by demons, and simply touching them could end his life. This made the young man realize that they really wanted to get rid of him since they had told him that the area was very habitable. That's why his system wanted to make a deal where, for a third of his magic, it would cleanse the entire area. When the boy accepted the deal, we saw an incredible light that covered the entire forest as it was completely cursed. After the spell ended, the system began to show him that he had leveled up not just once, twice or three times, but multiple times, practically overloading the system. In the same kingdom, we see the princess scolding her father because what he did to that young man was too cruel, practically kidnapping someone and condemning them to a certain death. But just then, one of the king's messengers approached with an urgent message. They had confirmed that someone had just used purification, the highest level sacred magic. So, the king quickly assumed it was his chosen golden knight, expecting nothing less from him. However, the messenger had bad news for his majesty. The magic they had confirmed came from the north, where they had just sent that poor boy to die. But for some reason, he had reached level 367 with just one spell. 
So, the young man simply started thinking about turning off the level notifications as they made no sense, and that strange symbol was still there, confusing him. This didn't make him forget that the deal for purification was a third of his magic. When he tried to see the magic barrier and noticed it quickly filling up again, the young man became even more confused. He didn't know if the forest had really been purified since it had been very easy for him. But regardless, he couldn't return to the city. So, his system recommended a change in appearance to be more comfortable. When he accepted, the first transformation was a bit odd, he ended up changing his entire body into that of a woman. But this wasn't what he wanted, so the next transformation turned out to be the best. Now, he looked different and could enter and leave the kingdom whenever he wanted. His system even offered him instant teleportation. Although the boy couldn't believe he had these abilities, he decided to test them. He easily teleported to the kingdom. This made him think, if he could teleport, why not try to return to his old world? When he tried to teleport back however, it simply didn't work. This didn't upset the young man much since it was expected. So, he accepted his new life and wanted to find some work to earn money and buy things. He decided to go to the central market where he aimed to find an adventurer's guild. When he arrived at the nearest one, a young woman explained that the higher their level in the institution, the greater the rewards. This made him realize that it worked practically like any other institution. When he registered, the young woman asked for his name. He knew he couldn't use the one the king had heard, so he used the name Philo, which was his pet's name. Once registered, all his information was on a pendant, and now he just had to choose the best rewards since he had a lot of work being at the lowest level of the academy. While doing so, he saw a young woman asking for an escort to the forest. However, because they didn't have much money, the adventurers simply didn't want to go, considering the risk too high for such a small reward. Still, the young woman pleaded for someone to escort her as her family lived there. However, the adventurers didn't want to waste any more time and simply ignored her. But Fleo didn't. He's a good person, so he said it would be easy for him despite the money, as he had been in that forest and could use teleportation. These words surprised everyone around since that spell was very rare. Just then, a young knight appeared and asked Fleo to stay away from the girl. She introduced herself as Balirosa, a member of the Royal Knights, and demanded an explanation. The group suspected Fleo might have ill intentions since teleportation was an advanced spell, so they wanted answers immediately. They even suspected him liking children's, leaving Fleo in a tough spot. He insisted he wasn't suspicious and had no problem escorting her too. Once outside the institution, he intended to use his spell, but Balirosa warned him that if he did anything strange, he'd pay for it with his head. With no other choice, Fleo used his spell, surprising the girls as they found themselves in the forest. He hadn't lied, and they were really there. One of the young mages approached him, asking if he was a high-level mage, but Fleo explained he was new to this world and didn't quite know what he was doing. The girls apologized to him, realizing he was sincere and genuinely wanted to help the lost girl. The forest was completely different from what she remembered, and Fleo wanted to tell her he was responsible, but the system warned him it was dangerous to inform a demon caused by purification. This confused Fleo, but Balirosa asked him to step back, seeing he seemed like a good person who didn't deserve to be hurt. The focus shifted to the little girl as the girls prepared to attack her. The guild had informed them about a suspicious girl seeking help to travel through the forest, a clear indicator of a trap, which turned out to be true when the girl started changing her voice and transforming into a giant white wolf. However, the demon introduced herself as Fenris, the sister of Fingadi of the Four Infernals. She claimed they would pay for ruining her plans, but since her brother had asked for food, they would at least serve some purpose. She quickly used her malicious spell, which weakened any nearby beings, but it had no effect on Fleo. The wolf wanted to finish them off quickly, but the brave boy wouldn't allow it, using his teleportation spell to send the four girls back to the capital. However, for some reason, he decided to stay, confusing the demon, who asked if he wanted to become her meal. But something inside Fleo urged him to do the right thing, so he wanted to defeat the demon once and for all, asking his system to activate all his spells to start the great battle. Then Philo used his first skill called Meteoric Leap, which managed to impress Philo because it was a skill he had never used before, even to defend against the demon. He had the ability to summon an earth wall to protect himself, and even the wind to create a powerful tornado that captured the Fenris. She could escape with teleportation magic and almost trap Philo. But he quickly caught her with increased gravity magic and began to ask the system for temptations to end the fight. Although the system advised using a skill called Subjugation, which enslaved the enemy object, Philo didn't want to use it because he didn't like having slaves. While he was thinking, Fenris tried to escape using anti-gravity magic, but it didn't work because the system cancelled her magic. 
Seeing that they couldn't defeat her, Fenris tried to teleport as a last resort, but the system prevented it. Even though the system kept recommending to capture her to win, Philo knew he didn't want to because he didn't want to be the founder of something as horrible as slavery. In the end, Fenris surrendered when she realized her magic had reached its limit and just wanted a quick death. Philo's kindness reassured her that he wouldn't do something cruel like that. This confused Fenris even more because she believed warriors of the demons didn't deserve to live after losing. Despite that Philo, with his kind heart, didn't care whether someone was a demon or a human. Surrendering meant they had given their all to win. So he didn't want to do something as cruel as taking a life, which made Fenris think she had encountered someone very foolish, leading her to undo her transformation. But when she did, Philo felt embarrassed because she wasn't dressed at all. So, being a good gentleman and knight, he gave her his coat so she could cover up. This lack of decency reminded Philo that he had some clothes in his bag. Before he could take them out, the demon passed out because she had used up all her power in the fight. As the sun set, Philo checked all his new powers in the system, wondering why he had so many and why everyone in the association was surprised. He thought teleportation was common because it didn't take much effort for him to use it. Meanwhile, the demon was slowly regaining her senses and the first thing she saw was her opponent, who had defeated her. She remembered losing all her magic power, but now it had completely returned for some reason. Without being hostile, she went to thank her opponent for saving her while she was unconscious and for not killing her. She promised not to fight against humans again as gratitude and offered to help her new master forever, which he accepted because of his incredible amount of mana. Philo knew she was going overboard with gratitude, but he still insisted she stay with him. In a final attempt, Fenris used her secret weapon, Puppy Eyes. However, Philo wasn't fully convinced because it was a sneaky and dirty trick. Seeing his rejection, Fenris promised to end her life because she wasn't even fit to be a servant. In a split second, Philo's opinion changed, feeling forced to accept her. Now having a new companion, the journey started off well. Philo revealed he wasn't from this world and had been summoned because they thought he was a hero. He showed his true form and admitted he had nowhere else to go. He didn't know what to do next, so following him might not be a wise decision since even he didn't know what to do next. But Fenris didn't care because she knew that according to the wolf's rule, they had to live for those they recognized as their absolute master. This finally convinced Philo to fully accept Fenris because of her strong commitment, and the pact was sealed with a tight hug from Fenris to her new master. Meanwhile, in the royal palace, the king complained about his chosen hero because he allowed the squadron that was supposed to fight alongside him to be annihilated while battling the demon king. However, the hero boldly claimed that he didn't help them because they were a group of cowards who panicked at the sight of monsters and broke formation. He insisted that nothing was his fault and, feeling deeply offended, he left as they wouldn't listen to him being blamed for something he didn't do. The king wanted more information, and a soldier by his side revealed that the so-called brave hero always stayed at the end of the soldier line, complaining about every little thing that happened, which displeased the king. Returning to the hero, we see that he didn't understand what was happening because he had been training hard for a whole month, yet his skills hadn't improved at all. We also meet Tsuya, the hero's personal servant, appointed by the king to assist him in everything he needed. Back with our protagonist, Fenris signed a contract, realizing that she would need to work to eat and have a warm home. When a vendor addressed Fenris as, Madam, she was confused, and Philo explained that since they were both shopping together and seemed to be of similar age, it appeared as if they were engaged, which could be advantageous as it wouldn't raise suspicions. Fenris loved the idea of being Philo's wife because she would have a strong husband to take care of her at all times for eternity. At the Adventurers Association, Philo showed his new wife the device he had to store all his information. And now that she would share work with her husband, Fenris explained that when elves marry, they usually share the food they hunt as a sign of love. Working with him reminded her of that sweet tradition of her species. So, when the assistant at the association asked for Fenris's name to put on the list, the demon almost revealed her true name. But Philo suggested they use the name Riss instead, as it was best not to use their real names now that they had a new life. However, an emergency arose at the association with an urgent bulletin reporting a group of psychoses sighted north of the kingdom. These monsters, if not stopped, would attack the kingdom. Everyone knew these were the same monsters that had defeated the hero's army. Due to the seriousness of the situation, the rewards for that day's missions would increase by tenfold, catching Philo's attention. He knew even the hero couldn't defeat them, but Fenris wanted to prove herself. She believed that if they won, it would demonstrate their strength together. With Philo's teleportation, they quickly arrived at the mission area, where screams led them to investigate. They found the same psychoses from the reward bulletin attempting to attack the girls Philo had saved earlier. 
One of the monsters almost harmed one of the girls, but Philo's lightning magic stopped them. Fenris prevented them from attacking the adventurers, as they were the girls her husband knew. Valerosa, recognizing Philo, thanked him for his help, but warned it might be the last time as the monster they faced almost defeated them. Fenris didn't like being called a monster and felt sad when Philo introduced her as his new travel companion instead of his wife. One of the surviving psychoses tried to attack a human, unaware that Fenris wasn't in the mood for nonsense. With just a glance, she made the creature surrender. To survive, it tried using puppy eyes, giving Fenris the idea to make it her personal pet. Since the creature was very docile, Philo liked it, and he finally used a restraint to make it a new pet. However, it still looked too terrifying, so he also used shape-shifting magic to make it a bit more friendly. With its new name safe, our protagonists gained a new pet. But this scared the adventurers, as they were not only in the presence of two individuals who effortlessly defeated the psychoses, but also managed to capture one in seconds. Valerosa invited them to the adventurers' headquarters to show gratitude properly. There, they introduced themselves. Blossom, a young and strong fighter specializing in heavy combat. Bleer, a former soldier turned adventurer and Villano, the group's defensive magic user. Valerosa asked one last favor of her hero, to be their leader, as the kingdom was in a difficult situation with a new hero, who fought from behind the soldiers and was too cowardly to face the Dark Lord until he had trustworthy soldiers. They knew deep down he was a complete coward. As the king had ordered all fighters in the kingdom to start training to become strong enough to defeat a psychosis without assistance, they felt uneasy. Since even the four of them together couldn't defeat one, they wanted someone to train them to become much more powerful. But Philo himself didn't know what to say because he didn't fully understand his own powers and Fenris was feeling a bit crazy due to her jealousy. Philo felt compelled to correct his past words where he mentioned that Riss was not only his travel companion, but also his dear wife, making her blush. Now, without jealousy, Fenris had no problem with her new husband helping those in need, leaving Philo free to agree to help the troubled young women. He assured them that although he wasn't the best teacher, he would do his best to help them achieve their goals. Meanwhile, far from where Philo was, a demon named Ulimenes informed her lord that someone had used purification in the forest they had cursed. She requested the wisdom of the demon king, who, upon learning it was just a human, ordered their immediate capture as they could be dangerous to face in the future. In the morning, when our main character woke up, the first thing he saw was Fenris, saying good morning to him. He asked her what she was doing in his room, and she replied that he shouldn't be surprised because they are now a couple. Philo remembered their conversation before going to sleep, where they agreed that she would be taken care of as his wife. She wanted to do intimate things, but Philo refused because he thought he liked men, and it was too early for that. This made Fenris cry, thinking he didn't want her as his wife. Philo comforted her, saying it takes time for humans to get to that point, even though it was a lie. To avoid temptation, he decided to sleep in the living room, but Fenris insisted they sleep together to convince others they were a couple. Meanwhile, Balirasa interrupted them, apologizing for intruding. This awkward moment confirmed their relationship. Later, Balirasa faced a big boar, but ran away, leaving Blossom to deal with it. Seeing Blossom in danger, Fenris ordered Bolano to protect her with magic. Philo asked Bilary to shoot arrows at the boar, but they weren't strong enough. Bolano used up all her magic, leaving them vulnerable. The teachers realized they needed more time to make the girls stronger. Half an hour later, Philo showed the girls their cozy room, bought with the reward from their previous adventure. He invited them to stay since their training would take time and they wouldn't mind having company. Bali Rosa and Bolano thanked him and Fenris called everyone for lunch. Philo found the meat raw because Fenris took it fresh from the boar they killed, forgetting to cook it. He politely offered to finish cooking. Fenris was puzzled because fresh meat was better, as confirmed by their pet side. Despite that, Philo's cooking impressed the adventurers, who asked if he used magic. He said no, he just knew how to cook, with help from Balirosa, who revealed her noble upbringing didn't involve much luxury, so she had to learn to cook to survive. The girls praised their cooking skills, but Fenris felt jealous, thinking her grass salad couldn't taste as good. Philo assured her he made the salad, and she realized how tasty it was. She even dared to try the cooked meat, which, despite not being raw like she preferred, was delicious. She thanked Balirosa for the meat and promised to cook it properly next time. 
at the Adventurers Guild, they stood out because of their unusual success in hunting boars, leading others to gossip about them. But Riss ignored them and asked her husband for permission to explore the outskirts. Just then, Leo from the guild appeared and wanted to talk to Philo. Riss was free to go as Philo had business to discuss. Leo wanted to discuss Philo's achievements, which were well known throughout the kingdom. The king himself sent a special request for Philo to become a hero's assistant. If he accepted, Philo would be named an honorary knight. Leo praised Philo's hunting skills, urging him to accept the offer, as such opportunities don't come often. Philo, however, declined respectfully, as he had more important things to do, like defeating demons. He then met his wife, who seemed to have battled a monster alone, but in reality, she struggled in a cooking class. Riss was determined to improve her cooking skills to win her husband's heart. Back at the castle, the hero enjoyed his luxuries and women. Hearing about Philo's exploits, the hero considered offering him a high position, assuming he hadn't accepted the king's offer. A month passed, and Philo continued to refuse the king's offers. Riss grew frustrated with the repeated requests and contemplated drastic action. Philo, understanding the messengers were just doing their job, decided to visit the garden where Blossom worked. He helped tend the vegetables, noticing Blossom's dedication exceeded her training. Meanwhile, Bellano struggled with her magic, so Philo gave her a magical ring to enhance her abilities. He cautioned her to be careful wearing it. While Bellano trained, Blossom was attacked by a giant worm. Philo rushed to help, but Riss intervened, suspicious of the situation. Despite Riss's jealousy, she assured Philo she wasn't trying to steal anything. But when dinner time arrived, Riss finally managed to cook something delicious. She revealed that although she was afraid to learn, she had worked wonders in the past month, driven by someone special. Remembering her teacher's advice on capturing a man's heart with delicious curry, Philo was about to taste Riss's secret weapon. It worked wonders as he was enchanted by it. However, lurking behind them was Uliminas, who couldn't believe Fenris was with a human. In the past, she was the bravest warrior of the Dark Army, and Fenris herself caught her spying. Fenris brought her inside, offered her tea, and the demon, not used to it, burned her mouth. More importantly, Uliminas asked why she was there. Riss simply stated that there was nothing strange about it since she was living in her new home with her husband. This surprised Uliminas so much that she burned her mouth again while pondering how much Fenris had changed. To make matters worse, her human husband was very strange, she couldn't gauge his magic level despite being an expert. When Uliminas began to wonder if they hadn't noticed the recent monster attacks, Philo revealed they were unlikely after purifying the nearby area. This made Uliminas realize that Fenris's husband was responsible for her brother's death. However, Riss quickly reassured Philo not to feel guilty, stating her brother's fate was due to his weakness. Despite hearing this, Uliminas knew that Fenris's husband was a threat to the Dark Lord. So, she prepared to confront him that night, intending to end his life with poisonous claws and a surprise attack. However, Philo, with a forced release, countered two spells and subdued Uliminas until she surrendered. This left Philo with the task of discussing what to do with the adventurers regarding this secret. All the girls, grateful for their support, promised not to say anything, even though they were useless. Suddenly, a loud noise interrupted them. As they stepped outside, they found Ulimina's back for revenge, accompanied by a horde of dragons. These dragons were meant to show who shouldn't be messed with, but Philo seemed more excited to encounter one in real life. With his celestial hammer spell, he defeated all the dragons in an instant, terrifying everyone else. However, Blossom decided to face one of them to level up in the future. Philo saw an opportunity and asked her to throw her gardening tool at one of the dragons. When she did, it enhanced the air, technically allowing Blossom to defeat the dragon and earn the title of Dragon Slayer. This sparked the other girl's interest in obtaining the same title, but since the dragons had already fled, it was impossible. Meanwhile, the Dark Lord Gaul observed all this, intrigued by the strength of his opponent and preparing to test the mysterious adventurer's true power. 
Philo cleaned the dragon area and put a better barrier near his home, which will alert him if any demon or intruder bothers them again. If it doesn't work, the strong wrist promised to take care of any enemy or home-wrecking cat who dares to bother them. Philo didn't seem completely calm because even though he had chased away Illuminas, he didn't forget that she revealed the murderer of Riss's brother, who was Philo himself. So deep down he felt a bit bad, but since his sunny wife wasn't sad, he continued as usual. In the house, the girls couldn't stop staring at Blossom's Dragon Slayer title. Blossom was super happy because with Philo's help, she got the legendary title. The impression was so much that Volano almost started to worship the mighty roast, and the girls had to stop her. On the other hand, Ballyrosa wanted to go beast hunting again, which made her friends admire her even more because she was so disciplined with her training. This indirectly motivated Volano, who wanted a new title, as did Ballyrosa, who was seen crying with envy for not having the incredible Dragon Annihilator title, which could have regained all the lost honor of her family. Suddenly, a stranger, unarmed despite being in a dangerous area, asked for Fenris, which made the knight realize there was a demon in front of her. With her sword, she wanted to confront it, but the demon had no intention of fighting and just left, leaving a message for Riss. If she wants to talk about the past, he's open to a chat. This message was given by Gozel, and the man left peacefully. A second later, our main characters appear, very worried about their companion, who reassures them that nothing bad happened, she was just talking to a low-ranking demon who had a message for Riss. When she mentioned Gozel's name, Phalo's wife knew it was the worst possible made-up name. Philo, in turn, recounted that he got scared because his barrier had activated at that moment, and by the time they arrived, they saw her facing a demon with the title of Dark Lord, so Riss quickly affirmed that Ballyrosa had been talking to the real Dark Lord, whose name is Gaul, leaving Ballyrosa somewhat frightened. But the next day, Gaul appeared at Riss and her husband's door, and he wasted no time showing his great hospitality by inviting him into their home. Unfortunately for Ballyrosa, she announced that she was leaving home when she ran into the Dark King again so for no apparent reason in the next scene, she was sitting next to him. Although she wanted to leave, her body wouldn't let her move, so the Dark Lord got to the point because he wanted Philo to join the Dark Army. However, Philo didn't hesitate to reject the generous offer because he had reasons not to take sides, such as not being from that world to begin with, and not knowing why demons and humans fight each other. Upon hearing this, Gaul wanted to inform the young man. So he began to explain that the war between humans and demons has existed for over 500 years, starting with the first Dark Lord, who was also from another world like Philo. Back then, demons were oppressed by humanity. Thanks to this Dark Lord, demons decided to become strong to gain supremacy. Although so much time had passed that currently, controlling the world didn't matter to anyone, Gaul knew he couldn't let such a powerful weapon as Philo fall into the hands of humanity. That was the main reason he came to ask Philo to join his forces, as it would be an excellent offer. But the young man rejected it again, stating that he wouldn't take either side, which made the Dark Lord give up for today, but he promised to try again. Also, Ballyrasa remaining so calm by his side earned her some respect from Gaul. However, when her friends approached them, they noticed that she had actually fainted, which is why she remained so calm. The poor girl finally rested a bit the next day and went down to eat a little, but to her extreme misfortune, Gaul was there enjoying some of Riss's delicious food while still asking Philo to join the army. He clearly kept rejecting it, so Gaul tried to get Ballyrosa to eat with them because he had some interest in her. But since she was dressed in that manner, she ended up lying, saying she would change, although she never did. And now, when she tried to leave, she looked around very carefully, but not even that saved her from encountering Gaul, so she ran out, claiming she was very busy that day. The next morning, when she was coming down after waking up, Gaul was there again, but another lie saved her that day. Later, when they were gathering food from the garden peacefully, Ballyrosa could see the silhouette of the Dark Lord in the distance. So she started running while lying, saying she had to go get more firewood for the cabin, which made Gaul think she was a very hard-working damsel. Meanwhile, in the distance, we see a guard watching the area, so when he arrived with his majesty, he ended up informing him that there was a demon frequenting the house of the prodigious adventurer. This couldn't enrage the king more, who despite inviting him so many times, ended up being rejected and betrayed by his worst enemy. He almost sent a large army to deal with them if it weren't for the princess asking for some calmness because they still didn't know if Philo had really joined the opposing forces. Sending soldiers against him could be a bad idea since they probably couldn't defeat him, and this might anger him enough to join the Dark Army. So for him, the best idea was to talk to him since his invitations were always to say yes or no, and this somehow annoyed the king because he didn't believe that was the right way to govern a kingdom. 
The great hero appeared because he couldn't relax from all the shouting, and having heard the whole conversation, he didn't hesitate to ask for several soldiers because if Philo didn't obey willingly, he would bring him to his side by force. Meanwhile, in the Dark Kingdom, Eliminus asked where his majesty would go, and he informed her that he would go to Philo's house again because he was determined to have him in his ranks. As he left, the demon cat began to wonder what the rest of the demonic kingdom would think now that their lord was associating so much with a mere human. Philo was at home, deep in thought, so his wife asked if he was okay. He admitted he was thinking about selling equipment made from dragon scales because his first prototype, a shield, turned out quite well. If it succeeded, it could become very popular, giving them a good business to live off. But Riss wanted her husband to tell her the truth, specifically about whether he made the right choice not to work as a hero for the king, as it would bring in a lot more money and make better use of his skills. She started to believe she was the reason Philo didn't accept, but he assured her she wasn't responsible, he just preferred to avoid unnecessary fights despite having so much power. When the doorbell rang, and they went to see who it was, they found the hero, who brought a ridiculous amount of knights to threaten Philo with two options, become the hero's subordinate or face his sword as a traitor. The hero was confident because Philo didn't speak, so he thought he'd choose the first option, bringing him closer to becoming a legend in this new world when he defeated the demon army. But when Philo rejected him and apologized for attracting so many people, saying he didn't want to join any side, the hero had no choice but to treat him as a great traitor and execute him on the spot. The group of adventurers knew this was unfair and began to assure everyone that they knew he hadn't made any deals with the enemy. However, the hero with his status could also end them and claim they were another group of traitors. This left Philo with no choice but to escape even though he didn't want to fight. Since the situation was affecting his friends, he asked his wife if she minded them fleeing, even though it wasn't the most courageous option. To Riss, it didn't matter, as long as she was with her husband, she was happy. Before using teleportation, the group of girls asked to go with him because they were always told that demons were the enemies. However, since they met Riss, they began to doubt those words. So, even though they were considered traitors, they had no problem leaving with Philo. Upon hearing this, Philo began to activate his giant scale teleportation spell, sealing his entire house and some of the nearby garden they had worked so hard on. This left the hero speechless because he couldn't believe that a simple nobody could not only use magic he couldn't but on such a large scale. After they left, one of the knights informed the hero that the demon they were watching had just arrived. The hero wanted to catch him to bring something to his majesty. But Gaul, noticing that his almost new recruit had been lost because of humans, began to get angry, showing his true self and calling forth all demon forces. This scared the hero, who bravely withdrew from the fight. On a map, we see how far Philo teleported, ending up in the middle of a forest almost identical to his old home. Philo assured them they were close to H-Town, basically to the west of the royal capital, where they shouldn't be found. This made the girls quite happy since they wouldn't have to see the hero for a while. Even Balirosa was more at ease knowing Gaul wouldn't bother her as usual. Riss affirmed to her husband that he should never doubt if she would follow him because they would always be together. Around midnight, Riss went straight to cook something delicious with their new family, who were all starving. The Dark Lord gets angry because the blonde hero and his guards forced our main character to move from his place. They were close to reaching the royal capital, and a messenger warned the king that their shields wouldn't last long against them, especially without the hero. This worried the king, but his trusted advisors suggested gathering the kingdom's best wizards for an emergency purification to stop the enemy. The hero might not even show up to help, and if they took the capital, they might lose the war. Gaul was talking to Green Isle, planning a purification, and the Dark Lord ordered an immediate retreat to exploit the kingdom's mana shortage, seeing it as a future advantage. So, the best wizards and the king combined their mana to cast a heavy spell that purified the entire area. Then, we see Philo returning home to Riss, who was eager for his return and invited him for a drink, wanting to hear about his search for prices for his armor project. Philo found many blacksmiths, and he hoped his armor business would be profitable enough for him to live off. This excited the girls, who knew they needed to pitch in to help Philo. Blossom suggested selling vegetables from her garden since they often had extras, and Bilary thought about breeding horses for utility, remembering how she used to care for them in the past. Philo agreed, letting them use the back of his home to work. However, Volano and Balirosa didn't know what to do to make money, which made them feel a bit down. Riss assured them they didn't need to worry about bringing in money because the leader's wife's duty is to care for everyone. Philo also asked them to calm down, saying if they put effort into sword and magic, they might eventually find something to earn money, which eased their minds a bit, and they thanked him for everything. In the kingdom, there was no sign of demon thanks to the purification, but it wasn't permanent. 
They only had three months before the effects began to fade. Even the best wizards were severely injured and unconscious due to the massive amount of mana needed for the spell. The king himself was in critical condition for helping with the spell, and they didn't know when he would recover. So, the princess decided to take charge until her father recovered, and her first royal order was to strip the kingdom's hero of his rank because he didn't show up when the nation needed him. Despite the advisor's initial reluctance, the princess made them aware that even if they needed him, he wouldn't show up because he's a coward. So, they ended up kicking him out of the castle. The guy felt pretty indignant and was even ignored by one of the royal guards, who finally threw the useless hero out at dusk. While Philo slept, he talked to his wife about how much they've worked since arriving in the new location, thanking her for everything she did to take care of them, knowing it must be difficult for her as she's practically a wolf and living with humans. However, Riss was too sleepy to hear this gratitude. But for Philo, it didn't end there because he wanted to make his dream of living off his items as a merchant real. The next day, Philo was surprised by the date because the girls decided they would take care of the house so he and Riss could go out together for a while since they're always so busy and never get to have fun together. So that afternoon they had fun doing various activities and then went to the central market to see what fun things were being sold. After much browsing, Philo noticed that his beloved was looking at some cute earrings and brooches, so he chose one to try on her skin tone. When he saw how well it suited her, he ended up giving it to her as a gift. Later, the girls noticed how much Riss loved the gift because she was looking at it all day, making the girls slightly envious since Philo was such a gentleman. That night, while Philo slept, he found Riss in his bed. Even though she was asleep, she mumbled nonsense, and since Philo understood she had a long day, he let her sleep beside him. However, she kept getting closer, which made the young man nervous as he wasn't used to being married yet. Back in the kingdom, the hero got rid of a couple of royal guards because he was furious with the princess for kicking him out. The girl who always followed him wanted to know why they broke into the treasury since money shouldn't be a problem for him. However, the hero was actually looking for something to defeat the Dark King because he refused to be a commoner in this world, especially knowing that someone insignificant could create spells he couldn't, like the recent teleportation. He thought that with more power, he could live as he pleased. This attracted a demonic voice offering him what he desired. The voice opened a door, promising him unlimited power if he took the sword because it would grant any wish he wanted. Although the girl accompanying him started to get scared as she didn't know who he was talking to, the hero, with no other choice, took the sword, breaking a strange magical seal in the process. The voice revealed itself as a genie who controls the world's order. When the hero realized that only he could hear her and his companion could only feel fear, he demanded his wishes be granted, which the genie readily agreed to, granting him three wishes, though the exact wishes weren't shown. However, the princess of the kingdom had called upon an oracle mage, which was strange because the kingdom had never called her before. But the princess knew it wasn't the time to waste, and she had to use all her power to save the kingdom and its people. But before the oracle could see the future, strange callers trapped both the princess and her royal advisors. They didn't know what was happening. So, the princess, with an idea, asked them to check the treasury to confirm if anyone had entered. Although the oracle knew exactly what was happening, as the callers they had were called sacrifice callers, which appear when a certain genie grants a wish and usually places these callers on its victims, making it easier to cut their heads off. Even though some people in the room thought it was a lie, the princess confirmed it was true and explained a bit about the genie that the kingdom had sealed away. In the past they asked for Haya's help to defeat the Dark Lord and end the 100-year war. However, even though she helped them, Haya ended up sacrificing half of the continent's living beings. Seeing how dangerous Haya was, the kingdom gathered the best mages of the time to seal her away. Although the seal shouldn't have been easy to break, someone managed to do it. So, what the oracle said was true, and they had time until the genie granted her wish. The oracle began to read the cards, which gave the answer to find the true hero of the kingdom who was still alive in the world. The kingdom's secretaries immediately knew it was Philo. With the oracle's information on his whereabouts, it would be easy to locate him. But the princess didn't want to divide their forces at the moment, so she decided to go alone to visit him. At that moment, Philo was showing his shield to a man who couldn't believe he had a dragon shield. Philo assured him that thanks to his secret source, he could get these rare materials, making the man eager to buy the incredible shield. He also asked Philo to bring him anything strange from now on because he would buy it. This made Philo very happy as it was his first big sale, and he had made friends with the shop owner. So, Ballyrosa was proud of him, and Riss told the blonde that her husband in the other world was a merchant, so all of this was easy for him. When Ballyrosa mentioned that she envied Riss for having such a useful husband, Ballyrosa quickly clarified that she just meant she hoped to find someone like him someday, which calmed Riss down. 
Riss even explained that she already had a man in her life Gaul, who had fallen for her, pleasing Balirosa as she had just found out about her liking the Dark Lord. When Philo returned, he thanked the blonde for showing him the shop, which was very helpful. While they were returning, Riss couldn't deny feeling uneasy that they were spending less time together due to their work. So she made sure they went out like today, or at least occasionally, to avoid feeling lonely, which Philo promised to do from time to time. However, the genie appeared behind them to ruin the moment, wanting to confirm if it was indeed Philo she was talking to, as the hero ordered in his first wish to kill the young man who ridiculed him. The system activated to defend Philo, although Riss had already moved ahead and ended up receiving the full attack in her chest, to the point where even her brooch was destroyed. Haya seemed indifferent to harming an innocent and began generating spells to show she meant business, while Riss slowly ran out of breath. However, when Philo realized normal spells couldn't heal Riss's deep wound, he became focused on saving her. Even after Haya activated an advanced light and darkness spell to finish off Philo, he remained unharmed due to his system naturally blocking and learning from attacks. But with Riss gravely injured and unable to be healed by magic, something changed inside Philo, making him angry and determined to make the unknown woman pay, bringing the episode to an end. Philo vividly remembered that Riss had promised to be by his side for life because that's what she wanted, but for Philo, it meant much more. He had found someone who believed in him and chose to follow him despite not knowing him at all. He even recalled when Riss proposed to him to avoid a more serious relationship between them, and yet he accepted it with the greatest joy, even though he had inadvertently caused her brother's demise, something Riss forgave as a mere mistake and continued loving him just the same. Philo knew that without her, he wouldn't have been as happy in this new world. But now, she was gravely injured by a stranger who knew nothing about them or their relationship, intensifying his determination to seek revenge. Unconsciously, he tapped into his magic, attempting to turn back time, a spell he knew was not easy to perform. Haya, sensing his desperation, asked how he did it, only to be met with a swift blow from Philo, an act he deemed disrespectful to the powerful genie. However, Philo was too consumed by rage to care, demanding silence as he harbored thoughts of killing her. In a bid to save herself, Haya attempted a dark binding spell, which proved futile against Philo's strength. As she assessed her opponent's stats, she realized his power was limitless, and with each blow she received, she knew victory was beyond her grasp. Meanwhile, Riss seemed to have regained consciousness, albeit unaware of what was happening, her last memory being of a grave wound. Upon regaining awareness, she learned from Balirosa about Philo's efforts to heal her with magic. However, she also became aware of Philo's unprecedented anger, which troubled her deeply. To Riss, his newfound intensity seemed endearing, reminiscent of the hunter's gaze she had fallen for. Yet, this conflict triggered a memory for Riss, recalling when Philo assured her of his aversion to fighting and killing, his willingness to surrender. In those few words, Riss understood that they were fighting for her and that was all she needed to know. Although the genie, despite being very powerful, was clearly no match for Philo, who seemed determined to end her. Even though his opponent had surrendered, he was so enraged that he continued to strike relentlessly. Riss intervened, urging him to stop, as seeing his reaction made her quite happy. She reminded him that he spared the genie because he didn't want to kill anyone who had surrendered, and ending someone in the same position would sadden him, as it would mean losing his kindness. To defuse the situation, Philo embraced her warmly, grateful that she was safe and sound. Meanwhile, a powerful teleportation spell was activated nearby, indicating that the princess was searching for the protagonist. Gathering all her wizards, she apologized for forcing them to use teleportation, but they lamented their exhaustion and lack of magic to teleport to other cities. The princess ordered them to rest and the rest to inquire about Philo, as finding him was their top priority. Just then, the caller condemning them to certain death inexplicably exploded. The princess could only imagine that the genie had failed to fulfill the wish. Meanwhile, guards found the hero, who was hiding like a rat, realizing his situation was dire, as he would likely face decapitation if discovered. Despite this, his hatred burned strong, knowing he had been lied to about his desires. Suddenly, a strange voice emanated from the sword hilt, questioning if the genie had truly failed. With its mist, it ensnared the girl with him, taking control of Tsuya's body. According to this mysterious woman, Tsuya's form was quite appealing, so she cast a peculiar spell to change her attire, thanking the hero for freeing her. Introducing herself as Dame Malinas, the great mage of darkness, she boasted of being far superior to the genie, granting the hero immediate power and transforming him into a monstrous creature. 
practically becoming the mage's new pet. Upon seeing a magical circle, she set off to seek vengeance on the nobles of the era, believing they had unjustly sealed her away for centuries. In the end, Philo managed to heal Haya, but upon waking up, fear still lingered within her. She immediately pleaded for mercy, unsure of her fate. Philo explained that she was alive because his wife wasn't severely injured. However, Valerosa didn't know what to do with her, as the royal knights wouldn't be able to control her. Philo then suggested resealing her, which made the genie suspicious since he didn't possess that knowledge, confessing that he had gained more spells after their fight. Philo took advantage of Haya's unconsciousness to delve into her memories. He discovered that it was the hero who had freed her and ordered her actions, leaving Haya speechless, as the memory projection spell was her own creation. Realizing that resealing her could lead to a repeat of events, Riss proposed the idea of having Haya work for Philo as his servant. While Philo didn't initially want a servant, Riss argued that having a legendary genie in their group would enhance their prestige, Although Philo hesitated due to Haya's recent harm to Riss, she assured him that her weakness had led to it. With no other options, Philo extended his hand, offering Haya a place in their group on the condition that she wouldn't kill again, showing his willingness to forgive her. This act of mercy puzzled Haya, accustomed to humanity's obsession with power and hatred. However, facing someone more powerful yet compassionate like Philo intrigued her, leading her to accept his offer and acknowledge him as her master. This gesture prompted Philo to apologize for his earlier outburst, and Haya seemed to both remember and enjoy Philo's gaze, indicating a newfound understanding and perhaps even a sense of connection between them. Philo's actions sparked jealousy in Riss, who sensed something amiss. While Philo focused on aiding the townsfolk affected by the destruction, he contemplated using temporal manipulation magic to fix everything. However, Haya advised against it explaining that this particular power controls time within a specific area, causing discrepancies between the spell zone and outside it, leading to strange issues. She suggested she alone handle it for now, as she had the most control, minimizing potential problems. Philo found this intriguing, pondering why, if he could use the spell, he encountered so many issues. Haya clarified that despite his supreme status and infinite statistics, he was still prone to errors. This reminded Philo of the strange symbol he had seen upon arriving in this world, which Haya explained was due to his ability to learn skills through an ability called Epiphany, possessed by only a few transcended beings. Thus, he could use temporal magic but needed caution. As evening approached, Philo introduced Haya to the rest of the group, who seemed apprehensive about her presence. Valerosa took her aside to her new quarters, but Philo couldn't shake off thoughts of the day's battle. When Valerosa later found him, he confessed to feeling tired and puzzled by his vast power's complexities. She empathized, admitting to similar feelings despite lacking Philo's strength. Everything felt confusing lately. Their true enemies turned out to be allies, and allies became enemies. This left her wondering whom she should wield her sword against. So, in a way, Valerosa felt grateful to have met him, as otherwise, she'd remain in another world without knowing these things words Philo understood as indirect thanks. When they reached their room, Riss was deep in thought. Approaching her, Philo asked what was wrong, and she immediately pressed him about returning to his old world. Philo was puzzled how she knew, but Riss revealed that Haya had practically mentioned it. Absorbing the power of those she faced wasn't normal, so now Philo likely had the ability to control genie magic, potentially allowing him to return. Riss quickly asked him to take her with him, not wanting to be alone or abandoned. Philo assured her he wouldn't leave, as the other world held nothing for him. He wanted to be with her as much as possible. He then proposed to Riss again, this time seriously, realizing how much he needed her after nearly losing her that day. With a kiss, Riss accepted the proposal. However, before they could proceed, they noticed Haya observing them from the door. Riss asked how long she had been watching, and the genie admitted she had been there since they sat on the bed, intending to stay to watch over her supreme being and learn from him. Philo recognized this as a total invasion of privacy and intervened before things escalated. Despite Riss's embarrassment, their loud argument was heard by others in nearby rooms, highlighting the lack of privacy. The genie's final offer was to become invisible to make them more comfortable, as she understood human customs, but Philo and Riss declined, feeling it would only make them more uncomfortable. The following day, the princess of the kingdom was relentless in her search for Philo. She went from business to business, asking about him, but luck was not on her side. No one knew of anyone as strong as Philo. Nonetheless, the princess was determined and would not give up until she found him. 
as the fate of the kingdom depended on it. Meanwhile, Philo was enjoying a fantastic breakfast prepared by his wife, Riz, with the help of Haya. This assistance allowed them to prepare larger quantities of food. Haya wanted to use magic to cook, but Riz insisted on doing it manually, believing it was her duty as a wife to cook for everyone without magic. However, not everything was perfect for the girls. They were worried that Haya was taking over their household tasks, the only chores they did. Philo had his own concerns, as the genie, Haya, kept calling him Supreme Being, a title he didn't want. For Haya, this was unacceptable. With Philo's abilities, she felt he deserved this title forever, despite Philo's discomfort with it. Later, we see Blossom working hard in the fields with Saib, motivated partly by her fear of the genie. They believed that a genie shouldn't be able to work as well as they could. Bylery was also busy, feeling down because she had proposed using carriages to transport people with their horses, but had only had time to care for the horses, which frustrated her. The horses tried to comfort her. Even Villano felt sad, having left the knights to become a mage like her family. Despite knowing she didn't need to push herself so hard, she remembered how Philo had spent a lot of time helping her improve her spells. She knew she couldn't allow all the time and effort of the young man who had helped her so much to be wasted due to a simple depression. However, when a loud noise from Blossom rang out, the girls rushed to see what was happening. They quickly discovered a magical beast wreaking havoc in their garden, and worse, it was about to attack them. Thanks to Volano's magic, the beast was immobilized. While Balirasa wanted to eliminate the beast quickly, Bailari had a different plan. She asked Saib to revert to his original form to calm the horse and with a rope and shovel, she somehow managed to climb onto the beast and soothe it, preventing further damage to their precious garden. This delighted the other girls, knowing they had a true expert on their team. Nonetheless, Bailari had another question. Could they use the land near their new home? Valerosa clarified that the land wasn't theirs since it belonged to someone else, unless they bought it as Philo did, to use it freely. At that moment, Philo was on a date with Riss, well, a semi-date, as they went to sell some equipment crafted by the young artisan. Upon meeting their new business partner, he was amazed by an item made from salamander skin, sure to be popular among women for its lightness. He suggested adding some shine by incorporating gems. One gem in particular caught Philo's eye, a bright light stone, very rare and valuable at that time. Outside the establishment, Riss couldn't be prouder of her talented and honorable partner, who used his ingenuity to move forward. But when a strange shadow darkened the sky, the princess, nearby, was also enveloped in darkness as a portal opened, revealing a beast ready to attack. It turned out to be the hero, recently deceived by the mage Damalinas. As soon as Philo recognized the threat, he didn't hesitate to confront and defeat the beast to protect the citizens from harm. The attack was aimed more at the princess of the kingdom than at the citizens. When the soldiers tried to protect her, they were simply blown away by a wind spell. The danger was so great that the genie arrived to protect her masters, informing them that the beast was actually a human, likely transformed by the witch possessing him. This witch was the Dark Mage, once the most powerful mage in the kingdom. However, due to her greed for power, she resorted to dark magic and earned her infamous title until the hero of that era had to kill her to stop the threat she posed. Yet, her dark magic allowed her power and mind to survive. It seems that the humans of that time made the mistake of sealing two monsters together. Riss realized that the genie was implying part of this was her fault because when she was freed, she used magic to break her entire seal, which also released the dark mage. Taking responsibility, the genie asked her supreme being for permission to personally handle the threat, which Philo immediately granted, using the opportunity to evacuate the citizens with Riss. Back with the princess, she recognized Damalina's, knowing they were after her life because her ancestors had imprisoned her. Anyone would hold a grudge if they were sealed away for a thousand years. When Damalinas ordered her beast to crush the monarch, Haya intervened, preventing any harm. This confused Damalinas, who didn't understand why a genie would protect a human. Nevertheless, she quickly cast another powerful spell, which also failed to hit its target. The genie revealed that no spell in this world could harm her, a fact confirmed by the Dark Mage, even the brute force and combined dark magic of her beast couldn't touch the genie. Unfazed, Damalinas cast a forbidden spell to make her beast enormous, but someone from a distance had broken the seal. Obviously, our protagonist had used liberation, saying the situation was getting out of hand, which embarrassed the genie who had failed to keep her word. She then asked for the power to finish off the enemy once and for all. Damalinas was very confused, as a mere human had nullified her spell 
and the genie took the opportunity to defeat her. This freed Haya and the hero from her control, consuming her like a Majin Buu candy, trapping her in a mental world. The genie's true goal was to take her as an apprentice, a genie thing. But she believed Damalina's could also be useful to the supreme being, Philo. Finally, the princess found Philo and introduced herself as Elizabeth Clyrod, the heir to the throne. She apologized for how her father and the former hero of the kingdom had treated him, who clearly never deserved that title. Elizabeth offered Philo the title of hero again, believing he was perfect for it. However, Philo refused, saying a true hero wouldn't hesitate to use his power to help humanity. He had more important things to care for now and just wanted to live peacefully with his wife. At sunset, back home, the girls asked Philo about expanding their property. Bilary wanted to capture and raise beasts and horses, while Blossom wanted to grow new vegetables, but they lacked space. Riss knew this might not be a good idea for the carriages, as magical beasts would never obey a weak human race. However, Philo believed she could manage it and promised to talk to the neighboring landowner to make a deal. Bilary didn't want to be so forward, so she promised she and her friends would pay for the land themselves. Philo calculated the costs, which were quite high, and when the girls saw the price, they were shocked by all the zeros. Philo knew this was normal since his recent purification had made monsters scarce, raising land prices. To avoid seeing his friends depressed, Philo promised to buy the land on the condition that they would take care of it. Additionally, Philo requested 30% of their monthly profits, so they wouldn't feel useless. This made them very happy. After buying the new lands, Philo remembered that Blossom wanted to plant new vegetables. He suggested planting some difficult to cultivate ones since they could control the soil temperature with magic. However, Blossom couldn't accept this help because she wanted to be self-sufficient without depending on Philo. Haya then offered to help Blossom, stating that as her master's servant, she could assist without problems. But Blossom still wasn't pleased, knowing they would still be using magic, so she declined the offer. Villano then appeared, asking Blossom for a chance because she wanted to see how the genie controlled the weather. Villano had recently returned to the school she once left and was now hired as a teacher, thanks to the powerful spells Philo had patiently taught her. This experience changed Villano's perspective on magic, realizing it could be useful in everyday life, not just combat. She asked Blossom again to accept help, and Philo suggested they try a small part of the land first. If the vegetables didn't turn out well, they would leave her alone. Blossom agreed to this trial. At sunset, the genie began using her magic to help in the field, leaving Philo with a view of the girls finding their purpose, which made him happy, even Riss, who knew the girls were enjoying their new hobbies. Philo couldn't deny he had found something new to pursue to his dream of opening a shop to sell his armors, a prospect that thrilled Riss. She promised to speak well of his business to all their friends, asking them to turn into humans before visiting to avoid problems. This moment was perfect for Philo to give Riss a wedding ring, made with a perfect light gem, which delighted the demon. In the distance, the former hero of the kingdom and his follower were imprisoned for their misdeeds. The hero swore vengeance as soon as he could escape his filthy cell, though he was no real threat. Now we move on to see Ballyrosa, who wore a beautiful black dress. Despite this, she wasn't quite sure why she was wearing it. Additionally, for some reason, Ulimines was wishing her blessings, which puzzled Ballyrosa. But when Gaul appeared, things became even more confusing, as he was wishing for Nightfall to come quickly for his honeymoon with the blonde. This was because she had woken up to what was practically a surprise wedding, and in the Dark Realm, we saw a Ballyrosa being praised by multiple demons who wished her a long life. Meanwhile, Gaul promised her that if she accepted the marriage, he would give her the world at her feet. Ballyrosa knew well what could happen if the Dark King decided to take over lands by force, it would mean the end of the world. So, she quickly wanted to stop the wedding, but she couldn't, as Gaul had already grabbed her to give her a proper wedding kiss. Fortunately, it turned out to be just a horrendous dream, causing the blonde to become more stressed since she had to endure it not only at home, but also in the middle of the night every day. The next morning, while making muffins with Riss, Riss couldn't help but notice that Ballyrosa didn't seem well. When Ballyrosa told her she had simply had a very bad dream, Riss quickly thought that perhaps she was in love. For wolves, dreams always reflect true inner feelings, and when one is in love, wedding dreams are common. This frightened Ballyrosa, as she wanted nothing to do with the Dark Lord. This talk about love drew the attention of the other girls and the legendary genie of the realm, eager to find out the gossip, especially who Ballyrosa might be in love with. Since Gaul was the main suspect, the other girls started teasing their friend to give him a chance. 
However, the blonde was quick to assert that this would never happen. Not to mention, he probably still harbors resentment because she once challenged him to a duel to the death with a sword. According to the blonde, he likely keeps coming back seeking revenge, which is why he's so persistent. However, the girls continued urging her to give him another chance, pointing out that even Riss managed to fall in love with a human like Philo. This brought up another piece of gossip since the girls never really knew how Riss and Philo fell in love. Riss began explaining how she felt about him, noting that wolves typically choose their partners through a fight. The first time she and Philo met, he had many weaknesses, leading to an inevitable battle between them. After their fight, they never harmed each other again. Deep down, Riss felt a need to help him for some reason. As Riss recounted how she fell in love with her husband, it became clear that Philo was among the girls, making the situation somewhat embarrassing for both of them. Suddenly, Philo's alarm went off because one of the magical barriers had been destroyed, possibly by a demon. The girls immediately wanted to fight, but Philo urged caution, suspecting someone was trying to deactivate it from the outside. This turned out to be true, as a demon was seen observing the barrier. Meanwhile, there were problems at the royal castle. The princess's messenger reported that most of Philo's gold coins, generously donated, seemed to be old road coins minted in the same castle. The princess recalled that after she rejected his request to become the new hero of the kingdom, he had given her a bag of coins to help the innocents who had lost their homes. She found it odd that he possessed road gold coins since ordinary people couldn't afford them. The messenger had a theory about how he acquired them. They had recently given road coins to someone named Banaza, who had accidentally appeared from another world during their attempt to summon the hero. The princess remembered the young man who went to the demon forest to perish due to his father's actions, the king. Gradually, the pieces of the puzzle started to fit together for the messengers, who suspected that Banaza, once banished, was now Philo, the new hero. The princess couldn't help but feel very sad, knowing that after all the wrongs done to him, it was natural he would never want to return. They wanted to apologize to Philo to seek some form of forgiveness. Just then, a soldier reported the bad news that the former hero and his assistant had mysteriously disappeared from prison. This left the princess with no choice but to order an immediate search for both. The princess felt profound regret as she had once supported the former hero, who turned out to be terrible, and did nothing to help Philo in the past. Outside the castle, soldiers were diligently searching for the fugitives, who had no choice but to hide. They knew that if captured again, they would never see the light of day. However, they didn't leave empty-handed. The hero took what he considered his payment for enduring so much nonsense. He was insulted to find only a small bag of gold, when he checked the bag's contents, he discovered it held infinite water and a treasure chest. Opening the chest, he found a shovel. Using the enchanted shovel, they dug many meters in seconds, evading capture but still needing to find a way out. In the Dark Kingdom, Gol wanted to know if they had located Philo and his companions. Uliminas had only bad news, as they couldn't find them and thought they might have fled the country. However, the Demon King knew that teleportation only works to previously visited places and with little time in this world, Philo wouldn't have many options. Uliminas suggested attacking the kingdom instead of searching for a mere human, arguing that their demons would eventually outnumber any purification efforts. But Gaul dismissed this idea, stating that it was pointless if Philo could purify them single-handedly. Overwhelming them in numbers would just mean sacrificing beasts without purpose. Gaul insisted on continuing the search for Philo. Uliminas questioned this decision, noting that many demons in the kingdom doubted the Dark Lord's authority because of his interest in a human. Gaul apologized to his servant for the trouble but remained determined to find Philo. Unbeknownst to them, a demon was eavesdropping on their conversation. This demon reported everything to Uagard, Gaul's brother. Furious that Gaul wanted to include a human in their ranks, Uagard concluded that his brother had gone mad and decided to seize the throne, believing Gaul was no longer fit to be king. Returning to the kingdom, Philo and Riss were finishing their shopping for ingredients and checking if anything unusual was happening in the city. Everything seemed calm, so Philo suggested they have lunch together to make the most of their time. On their way, they encountered Holdy, an old friend of Philo's in this world. She sadly informed them that she was closing her shop due to her advanced age and the loss of one of her best suppliers in the last attack. For Holdy, this was the sad end of her business. As they walked, Riss began to feel bad because she had never considered the impact of the war on ordinary people. Philo reassured her, saying it was a normal part of life and that the emergence of new businesses was proof of human resilience. Before they could enter to have lunch, Balirosa appeared and invited them to dine with her. This wasn't ideal for Riss, as it disrupted her alone time with Philo, but she accepted her blonde friend's kind gesture. 
Valerosa wanted to celebrate her promotion in Adventurer rank, which had brought her more money. She wanted to repay Philo and Riss for helping her improve so much. However, their celebration was interrupted by the appearance of the genie, who brought bad news. A mysterious being was nearby, ready to attack. They all prepared for battle, only to find it was the most powerful demon king in the realm. Philo invited him to join them for the meal. Gaul was delighted to see Balirosa again, though she didn't share his enthusiasm. The demon king was impressed by the human comedy and the colorful, delicious food, which was hard to come by in his realm. Philo was happy to have a lovely wife who cooked a variety of dishes for him. When Gaul inquired if Balirosa cooked as well as Riss, it was confirmed that Balirosa had quickly learned to cook delicious meals, which further impressed the demon king. Despite this, Gaul's intentions remained the same he wanted to recruit Philo. This, however, ended up angering Balirosa. Balirosa asked the demon king if he still harbored those nonsensical ideas. The demon king assured her that being a plague on this world wasn't a reason to wish for death. Philo didn't understand, so Haya explained that the main difference between humans and demons is the malice inherent in demons' bodies. While some demons and magical beasts can control this malice, others cannot. Those who can't control it constantly release small amounts of malice, which, over time, accumulates in large quantities and is harmful to humans. This explained to Philo why no one lived in the forest where he had been abandoned. Despite the explanation, Riss reassured Philo that their pet Saib and the magical beast horse could control their malice, so he didn't need to worry about them. However, the conversation was overwhelming for Gaul, who left immediately. As they walked through the sunset, Philo realized something that initially charmed him about this world, no one was marginalized. But after learning about the nature of malice, he understood that beings unable to control it were marginalized. On their way back, Philo, for no particular reason, just wanted to hug Riss for a while. She, of course, didn't mind enjoying some affection from her husband. Meanwhile, both the hero and Tatsuya continued their efforts to escape the deep pit they had fallen into. The next day, Riss delighted the entire family with her new recipes. On this occasion, to be more specific, it was some juicy homemade steaks that everyone loved. However, Riss humbly credited her culinary success to her teacher, Chef Milno. Although Philo almost forgot, as he didn't know that his beloved was still taking classes with her. Riss then started to tell us that she had also thanked Milno, as her delicious meals helped her secure a wedding ring. This not only pleased her cooking teacher, but also made her eager to teach Riss a new dish suitable for large families, perfect for the newly engaged couple. At that very moment, there was a knock on the door. When Philo opened it, he found the princess of the kingdom standing there. To his surprise, she hadn't come to ask him to be the hero of the kingdom again. Instead, she came to apologize because Elizabeth had discovered Philo's true identity, or rather Benaza's. Despite being caught off guard, they felt obliged to invite the princess into their home. Although Balirosa knew that the tea she prepared was not fit for royalty, she offered it graciously, and the princess quickly expressed her gratitude. However, she wished to speak privately with Philo. All the women agreed to give them privacy well, almost all. Riss refused to leave her husband's side because she was well aware of the harm the kingdom had caused him in the past due to its rulers. Philo understood this and agreed to talk to the princess alone, except for his wife. With no other option, the princess accepted these terms and finally found herself alone with Philo and Riss. The princess was about to kneel before the adventurer, as this was the only way she felt she could truly apologize for all the harm done to him in the past, including the cursed bottomless bag gifted by her father and the perilous journey to the forest of the Bissa, intended to end his life with a nearly broken sword. However, Philo insisted she should lift her head because Benaza no longer existed. He was now just Philo, a humble merchant enjoying his life in this world. Even if the princess apologized a thousand times, it would be futile because the past was the past, and nothing could change it. Thus, she decided to get straight to the point of her visit, as our protagonist was not easily fooled. A princess visiting his humble home solely to apologize made no sense, leaving Elizabeth no choice but to reveal her true intentions. Since her true intentions had been discovered, she pulled out a magical map of the kingdom. This map showed the exact positions of her entire army, as well as the secret locations of all the magical stones of each squadron, including their captains. However, all this information was highly classified, and our protagonist didn't quite understand why she was revealing so much to him. The princess then explained that they would soon be in danger because the purification spell they had cast with their last efforts was running out of time. This meant an imminent war against the demons. With all their best mages having exhausted their magic just to perform the purification, it was clear they were at a disadvantage. The map showed each army strategically positioned to prevent unwanted infiltrations. However, being so few in number, they couldn't protect all the nearby villages. This was a new proposal for Philo, not to be a hero as in the past, but to help the kingdom for a short period of time. Riss couldn't listen any longer and began to complain on behalf of her beloved. 
After all, the kingdom that once tried to end his life now only came back to use him, disregarding all the times he had already rejected them. He hated fighting in wars. Elizabeth then started to explain that her father, the king, was not in good health since the purification had left him unconscious. He would soon awaken, and given Philo's connection to the demons, it was evident that when the king returned, problems would arise for Philo and his family. Riz saw this as a total threat, but the princess assured them she had no such intentions. She wanted to explain her exact role in the kingdom while her father was out of power. She went on to say that the best she could do for them was to accuse her father of trying to kill the true hero of this world and appointing an incompetent one as a hero. Confirming this accusation would lead to significant problems, and with Philo's help, it would be much easier. Although it was said that the king protected the kingdom from multiple threats, he had not fulfilled his duty to protect the weakest in the kingdom. In short, Princess Elizabeth wanted to take control of the kingdom to save all her people, regardless of their strength. But to do so, she needed to demonstrate competence similar to the king. This continued to anger Riss, as they now wanted to use her husband to help a girl become queen. Fila, however, saw beyond the situation, understanding that the princess's main goal was to prevent him from joining the Dark Army. This impressed the princess while confusing Riss. Her husband then began pointing out the irregularities, like why Elizabeth would show classified information to someone associated with demons. Philo could only think that it was because she wanted him to protect them, as she mentioned that they couldn't guard the entire kingdom with so few troops. Once everything was clear, the young princess asked for Philo's help once again to protect her kingdom. Meanwhile, the former hero was still being pursued by the kingdom's forces, and his assistant, Suya, was starving. The false knight gave her one of his few remaining supplies, and Suya confessed she didn't know why she still followed him. Her companion had the same question for him, wondering why he fled with a burden like her when he could have left her behind long ago. Suddenly, a strange spider began launching its webs to capture them, revealing its true form as a demon who had come to the city to find sacrifices for its master. That night, Philo couldn't sleep, and Riss wanted to lie down with him to keep him company. She knew that her beloved might be troubled by Elizabeth's request, as accepting it would mean having to fight. However, they had started a new life, and if all went well, they might eventually have children who would live in a world where humans and demons got along if he worked hard enough. The next morning arrived quickly, and the Dark Lord's army was soon approaching a remote area of the kingdom, forcing all the villagers to flee for their lives well, almost all, as some children were still nearby, facing a grim future. However, a mysterious hero appeared to protect the little ones, buying them time to escape. Nevertheless, Riss continued to ask her beloved why he accepted a job that brought no reward. Philo explained that if he accepted something, it would only mean he was helping humanity for money. This quickly made Riss jealous, as she thought he worked for free because he liked Elizabeth, leading her to become depressed. A demon, seeing they couldn't break the barrier, summoned a cyclops, the strongest in the dark army according to Riss. When the cyclops began mocking the wolf family, Riss asked for permission to defeat it. She would not allow anyone to insult her fallen brother. She charged at the demon, who was not fast enough to touch her, and quickly tore off several pieces of its skin. For the cyclops, these were mere scratches, and he knew victory was almost his. Nevertheless, Riss mentioned how much she had learned to restrain herself thanks to her husband. She then began using teleportation magic to switch places with the Cyclops, who ended up hurting himself with his weapon in midair. All the while, Riss had been gathering trees to pin the demon to the ground. This only enraged the Cyclops, as he realized they wouldn't kill him, and Riss had been fighting him like a human. It was now the rest of the demon's turn to deal with Riss, but her husband wouldn't allow it. With his spell, he captured all the demons, ending the fight. Riss wanted to continue, but her husband knew there was nothing more to see, as her strength was far above everyone else's. Afterward, Philo used his healing magic on the Cyclops, confusing the demon who didn't understand what was happening. Philo insisted there was no need to fight, as he could teleport them all back to the Dark Realm in a second. However, they would likely return quickly, so Philo's goal was to show them how pointless it was to fight him, hoping they would leave voluntarily. Even though the demons wanted to know who he was, Philo only said he was a normal person who was friends with a demon. He expressed his desire to be friends with them too, but couldn't if they kept invading his village. With a display of absolute power, he assured them he would defeat them as many times as necessary to defend his land. This scared all the demons, who left upon seeing how intimidating Philo looked. This was no coincidence, as Riss had given him a tutorial on how to look menacing in five minutes before leaving home, teaching him all the poses to instill fear, which worked wonders. However, Riss knew they could return, so she pulled out a tutorial on how to torture. Philo didn't want to go that far and assured her that what they did today was enough to scare them. At that moment, some villagers arrived to thank Philo for his help, though they wondered why he was with a demon wolf. The mysterious young man simply said she was a great friend. A little girl wanted to thank him for saving her life, but Philo was the most humble of all, saying it was all thanks to the kingdom's princess who sent him to protect them. 
News of this quickly reached the kingdom when a messenger informed the princess that a mysterious hero had defeated the demons in the area. They didn't know his identity, but he fought with a silver wolf and mentioned that the adventurer fought thanks to the princess, leading to many letters of gratitude arriving in the mail. This made Elizabeth realize that Philo had finally accepted her request. Meanwhile, the mysterious hero continued to drive away demons while Gaul wondered from afar why his troops were disobeying him. Before he could descend, one of his servants informed him of an emergency in his realm. His brother had taken the throne by force and, along with his servant Fenris, was preparing for a new era. They planned to sacrifice two humans with good statistics to summon the evil god, which would give them the strength to overthrow Gaul, who was flying as fast as possible to reclaim his kingdom. In a scene change, we see Gaul visiting Philo and Riss with Uliminas. This time, he wasn't there to ask them to join his army. Instead, he sought permission to stay at their house for a few days. Although it sounded a bit odd at first, Philo demanded an explanation. Gaul began to explain why he was making this request. Not long ago, his servant informed him that his elder brother had seized power by force. Uluminas noticed demons in the castle, known as the Four Infernal, who supported Uigard as the new leader. Uluminas was the only one who disagreed, as Uigard believed that Gaul should not associate with humans and should instead embrace his demon heritage and eliminate them. Despite Uluminas reminding Uigard of his current role to find and imprison traitors, the Four Infernal were eager to witness the brothers' confrontation. Uigard was especially frustrated because Gaul was always elusive, never giving orders to advance their army, raising suspicions of betrayal. These accusations angered Uluminas, who recalled how many times Gaul had fought for and saved them. However, for Uigard, this was enough reason to confront him. The servant then asked Slave what he thought of this great betrayal, but the flaming demon was indifferent about who claimed the throne. Although he didn't mind if it was Gaul, he believed that a true leader should demonstrate his power when doubted by his people. He saw this as a good opportunity for Gaul to prove himself. Consequently, the four Infernal went to see Uigard, who had already taken the throne. His servant, Fufun, welcomed them to the new throne, but Uigard reminded them that Gaul was still their leader, and they shouldn't jump to conclusions. Fufun, however, disregarded this and ordered them not to intervene when the brothers began to fight, ensuring no one else interfered in their battle. The situation gradually became too much for the loyal Illuminas, who couldn't stand seeing her leader being disrespected by the servant. Without hesitation, she lunged at the servant's throat. However, before she could strike, Uigard intercepted with his tough skin, shattering her claws upon impact. Illuminas was then sent flying by a single blow, lowering the demon's guard. Despite her injured claw, she nearly managed a dirty trick to end her life. But failing this, she collapsed, exhausted, and exposed to the enemy. Just before she succumbed, Green Isle appeared, following Gaul's orders, to take her to safety. Gaul had finally arrived to reclaim his throne, where his brother quickly challenged him to a duel. Unfortunately, Gaul had no desire to fight his brother. But for Uigard, it was too late. Even his followers had accepted the combat challenge due to their doubts about Gaul's leadership. Gaul simply questioned what actions of his could be deemed foolish. His brother accused him of visiting a human city for pleasures and even Fufun commented on how soft Gaul had become, refusing any attacks on humans. This made it clear to Gaul what their grievances were and who had been sending forces to the human world. Ultimately, Gaul decided to accept the duel and used his demon ring, which delighted his brother. Victory would mean gaining the ring that symbolized the kingdom's leader. While the Infernals anticipated a powerful fight, Gaul unexpectedly removed his ring and handed it to his brother. Although confused, his brother felt deeply insulted by Gaul's laughter. For Gaul, the ring no longer made sense since his people believed he wasn't on the right path. Despite his brother's attempts to continue the fight, a single kick from Gaul sent him flying out of the castle into the abyss, solely for harming his beloved servant. Gaul then apologized to the Infernals for not being a good leader. During this distraction, the former hero Yuya took the chance to escape. Back in the present, Gaul finished recounting his story to Philo and Riss, explaining why he wanted to stay with them for a while. Understanding his situation, Philo asked for some time to consult with the other house members. When Ballyrosa arrived, she was petrified to see the Dark Lord again, especially when Philo sought her opinion about letting them stay. They called the rest of the girls to decide, and Gaul assured them there was no need to fear since he had lost his position as Dark Lord. This revelation surprised the girls. Gaul further explained that without his leadership, he couldn't live in his former kingdom and was forced to come to the human realm, where he had no friends except Philo. The demon had come as a friend to ask for their help. Blossom found this hard to believe, recalling that Gaul had attacked a nearby village. However, Riss quickly cleared up the misunderstanding, explaining that it was his brother who attacked, not Gaul. 
Gaul assured them he wasn't responsible and promised not to harm any humans nearby. When Volano asked if he would truly behave, Uliminus joked that she might have to eliminate her if they were rejected, which frightened the girls. Riss asked Uliminus if she still wanted to follow Gaul now that he was practically penniless. The loyal servant confirmed that she did, explaining that Gaul had given all his money to his former servants so they wouldn't go hungry. Since there wasn't enough left for her, she decided to follow him, but assured that she would no longer treat him with such high respect due to his poor life choices. Gaul reassured her that he could still achieve other things without the throne, just like Philo, who stopped the demon battle and became a completely anonymous adventurer. This revelation surprised Riss, as she couldn't believe they had been discovered. For the final decision, Philo said he and his wife had no problem with Gaul staying, leaving the final decision to the girls. Blossom began to think it wouldn't be too bad if it was only for a few days. Bylery reasoned that if they didn't cause any trouble, it wouldn't be a big issue. Volano and the genie were indifferent. However, Ballyrosa strongly objected, believing a demon would always be a demon. But when Riss put on her sad cat face, Ballyrosa's resolve weakened, especially seeing Riss had no problem with Gaul staying. Reluctantly, she agreed to let the demon stay in their home. Riss felt happy, knowing they now had the strongest demon on their side. Later, Gaul admired Blossom's incredible plantations, though she declined his help in the garden. Bylery also refused his help because Gaul only scared the magical beasts. With no other options, Gaul went to Philo and saw all the weapons he had made for his personal project, intending to sell them for a living. The dragon scale shields fascinated Gaul, as they were made from dragons he had defeated when Ulaminas tried to attack them. Despite this, he wasn't angry and affirmed that the victor can do whatever they want with the enemy. Upon closer inspection, he noticed several spells on the shield. Philo explained that dragons tended to retain spells easily, making it his best invention. Gaul joked that he might have to return to his kingdom if Philo kept inventing such powerful armors, as no one could stand against him. Philo assured him that his focus was more on adventurers than warriors and that he would never sell them as military weapons. This only made the demon laugh, while Ulaminas watched from a distance, wondering how her master could get along so well with a human. Balirasa, on the other hand, tried to distance herself as much as possible from the situation. Even at night, while everyone enjoyed their meal, she stayed away. Unable to sleep, a kind Riss appeared with drinks and cookies for Balirasa, wanting to talk because she seemed very sad lately. Balirasa admitted she felt guilty for speaking up since she lived there for free and didn't contribute like the other girls. She confessed she couldn't accept Gaul because many of her friends had died because of his army, even though she knew he wasn't evil. This contradiction bothered her deeply. Philo understood and assured her that her feelings were valid. Many humans felt the same way, but it might be best for her to accept others' different lifestyles and get along with the demons. After all, with him and Riss around, they wouldn't harm her. Riss took the opportunity to ask if Balirosa hated her for the past, as she had initially led them into a trap and planned to eat them. This scared Balirosa even more. To change the subject, Riss assured her she wasn't living there for free since the cookies were made using her personal recipe, which Philo loved. This cheered Balirasa up a bit, and the next morning, she went straight to Gaul and Ulaminas to talk, or rather, to threaten them. She warned them not to harm any humans, though Ulaminas knew Balirasa wasn't very strong. Balirasa reminded her that she had lost twice to Philo, and shouldn't talk about bravery, as she had run away from her leader last time. This made Gaul laugh, and he wanted to thank Balirasa for accepting them. However, she insisted she was only there to threaten them before heading to the forest to train. Deep down, she had accepted them. Meanwhile, the false hero managed to crawl to the exit with Tsuya, who was exhausted. He encouraged her to keep going, as they had escaped with a great bounty. The demons quickly noticed the escape, especially since Uigard himself couldn't fathom how the humans, known to be much weaker than his own race, had managed to flee and steal from them. Fufun attempted to explain this with a report suggesting hidden traps outside the castle set by the kingdom of Siru. This made Uigard increasingly frustrated with the weakness of his army, leading him to plan the creation of a larger and more powerful force. As a consequence, Fufun was punished for losing the documents she had brought, though she seemed to take some pleasure in her punishment. The confidence of the four infernal beings in their new monarch gradually diminished. Mugi and his two heads recognized the difference between Gaul, who always gathered data before a battle, and his brother, who preferred direct combat. Even Yuji knew that despite Uigard becoming more sensible, they would never be able to conduct reconnaissance as effectively as they had in the past with Ulaminas. This led them to fear they might be doomed to fight under a terrible leader. Slave was also discontented, observing that morale was dropping under Uigard's leadership. He predicted that the kingdom would soon fall to humanity due to poor strategic planning. 
However, Uigard's maid, who overheard everything from the roof, assured them that with his plan, there was nothing to fear. Although this was confusing for the infernal beings, Fu Fun reassured them that focusing on boosting morale could quickly lead to victory. Meanwhile, Philo had just won a great prize with his wife, who was thrilled to have received a voucher for a trip to beautiful hot springs for just the two of them. However, when the vendor explained that the voucher required a minimum of three and a maximum of fifteen people, Riss's excitement quickly turned to disappointment. She wanted a different prize since she had no interest in a group trip. Nonetheless, as it was still a prize, the entire group, including their demon companions, traveled to a remote area with all their friends. The demons noticed that everyone wore even stranger clothing than the rest of the humans. Valerosa explained that this was traditional oriental clothing called yukata. Although Riss was still somewhat disappointed about not being able to spend the trip alone with her husband, Philo pointed out the positives of traveling in a group, such as getting to know Gaul and Ulimanas better. Additionally, everyone was excited to enjoy the communal bath, although it only seemed to sadden the wolf behind. Villano recounted that, according to legend, the numerous hot springs each granted a different power. The genie couldn't understand why humanity placed so much trust in warm waters instead of pure magic. However, Bailary knew there was no harm in trying these powers, which included benefits like enhanced skin nutrition, magic, and increased fertility for women. Upon hearing about the fertility boost, Riss quickly imagined the potential benefits and became enthusiastic about the trip. When they arrived at Kinasaki's house, everyone received a warm welcome. Philo was asked to fill out a quick registration, while the rest were given yukatas to enjoy the area more comfortably. Riss took the opportunity to ask one of the temple girls which hot spring was known to enhance fertility. The kind young woman informed her that the Yagami bath, located outside, was the one she was looking for and handed her a map to ensure she wouldn't get lost. Riss thanked her and quickly headed towards the bath. Later, as the women went to change, Blossom accidentally bumped into a resident, who turned out to be Uigard himself. He nearly lost his temper with her, but Fu Fun intervened, allowing Blossom to continue on her way. Uigard demanded an explanation for why Fu Fun had let an inferior creature escape after daring to collide with him. Fu Fun reminded him that they were disguised as humans, both he and his army, to boost morale after so many defeats under his rule. Causing a scene over a minor collision would be counterproductive. Meanwhile, the four infernals, disguised as humans, joined in the festivities, eating and drinking. Few Fun continued to insist that they wear their anti-malice collars just in case. Despite their camouflage, Gaul, Riss, and Ulaminas quickly recognized them and wondered why they were there. Riss didn't care much. She warned the demons that they would pay dearly if they were discovered and ruined her pleasant trip with friends. Upon reaching their room, the women saw how spacious it was, where they would rest and enjoy their stay. Riss and Philo were to stay in a separate room, while Gaal, despite his willingness to stay with them, was assigned a private room due to Ulemina's and Balirosa's desire to keep him away. Blossom wanted everyone to stop bickering, and soon they began planning their activities. Ulemina's wanted to try some local food, Volano was interested in tasting the regional juices, and Bailary had a specific place she wanted to visit alone. Balirosa, unsure of what to do, left Riss and Philo with the option to head straight to their bath in the remote area. Haya wanted to protect her master, but the wolf stopped her, threatening to prevent her from coming closer since she planned to make a baby with Philo. This embarrassed Philo, who asked everyone to return in time for dinner. With that settled, everyone went off to enjoy their plans. Haya dealt with a past issue involving Damalinas. Inside Haya's mind, where the genie resided, it was revealed that she had consumed the soul of the mage Damalinas, binding it for eternity. Haya sought Damalinas's assistance in training, leading to the mage being tied to a bed. The genie had grown interested in human reproduction after secretly observing her supreme being with his wife. However, after being caught and expelled, she never saw the act completed. Damalinas explained that such acts were meant for lovers, and as they were both women, it wouldn't work as Haya wished. Undeterred, Haya, transcending gender, remained ambitious, frightening Damalinas, who eventually expelled her from her mind. Damalinas asserted that mutual consent was necessary for such experiments, complicating matters. Riss then headed to the Anagi bath with the map and agreed with Philo to enter. She assured him she needed extra affection after the bath, leaving Philo blushing. In the hot spring, Philo reflected on how it was the first time he had relaxed since arriving in this world. From the other side of the wall, his beloved spoke to him, reminding him of their missed alone time. Philo promised a private trip as soon as they could. Meanwhile, Bailary wanted to be alone to visit an adult museum. Bailary was discovered by Haya, who also wanted to explore the museum's erotic artifacts. The excitement led Haya to push Bailary into the museum to further their studies. Elsewhere, the group of girls drank excessively. Noticing Balirosa's constant glances at Gaul, they teased her until the demon commented on her beauty in the Yukata, much to Ulaminas's embarrassment. Blossom, enjoying the teasing, invited the demons to drink with them. The demon army, meanwhile, was relishing the delicious human food. 
Uigard pretended to dislike the food, claiming it was the worst he'd ever tasted. He demanded it be thrown out immediately, prompting Fu Fun to start tossing the prohibited items to cheer up the demons. However, His Majesty wanted something better, and, with a strong punch, sent her flying, though she seemed to enjoy it. Some demons began making jokes about the punches, which amused His Majesty, although the blows weren't entirely playful, leading to a brawl among the demons. During the fight, one of their collars accidentally fell off. Meanwhile, outside the area, the false hero and Suya were entering, seeking to relax after a long escape. They hoped to enjoy the best bath in the area using their jewels, which began to release cursed energy. The rest of the demons continued fighting, even breaking a room. Despite being disguised as a human, Fu Fun was quickly recognized by Tsuya, but they had bigger problems now as the stolen jewel possessed the hero again. Valerosa wanted to ask Uliminas if Gaul could truly lead the demons again. Uliminas quickly confirmed that Gaul, being the strongest demon, was the best for the job. Uliminas explained to Valerosa why she followed Gaul to the human world despite losing her power, and even revealed her jealousy when Gaul looked at other women. This made Valerosa realize that Uliminas was in love with Gaul. However, before they could discuss it further, a demon appeared and started destroying the area. Thanks to Philo, no one in the establishment was hurt as he managed to contain all the threats. He asked Riss to help save as many people as possible. Taking the order literally, the wolf went to rescue people as she was. From a distance, Gaul recognized the Malice Gem, knowing it was easy to destroy. Confident that Philo could handle the monster, he decided not to intervene. The girls, former adventurers, were dissatisfied with this decision. Knowing how much Philo had done to prevent problems in the kingdom, they decided to help. Gaul asked Ulaminas if they should assist, to which he replied that he never asked for her opinion but admitted a bit of help wouldn't hurt if it meant continuing to enjoy the delicious food. After teleporting, they encountered an angry Riss whose plans had been disrupted. The other demons recognized their lord, and his brother immediately went to seek revenge for their last encounter. The battle that ensued was intense, showcasing their abilities.